With around one third of human food crops dependent on pollination, the importance of bees for our survival is not to be underestimated. In recent years, the world has watched as hundreds of different bee species have rapidly declined, some teetering dangerously close to extinction. Many of the questions of how and why this is happening have focused on the better known and much loved honeybee species. But in southeast Queensland, a similar decline is taking place for our native bees. Small, shiny and black, our native bees are just as important as the exotic honeybees and yet remain relatively poorly understood. What happens to us if we lose these insects too? This is the story of the stingless bee. My name is Dr. Tim Hurd. I'm from Sugarbag Bees. I've worked with native bees for many decades now. All of our native social stingless bees are of a small size, about four millimetres in length for the worker cast, larger for the queen. And they're all black, so they, they're not a coloured bee. They're hairy, like most bees. That helps them to collect pollen on the outside of their body. Uh, and they don't audibly buzz like some larger bees do, simply because of their small size, we can't hear them buzzing. Our native stingless bees are highly social. That means they cooperate in a colony and they do that by working together to rear their young. The reproduction in the colony is dominated by the queen. She does all the egg laying. The workers are females that are sterile. They don't do any egg laying themselves, but they help their mother to rear more individuals for the colony. And then there are the males as well, which we call the drones, whose job is to mate with the queen. So our native social bees live in warmer parts of Australia, particularly the northern and east coast of Australia. So these bees nest in cavities, particularly in hollow trees. They're dependent on those trees for their survival and existence. Where land clearing occurs, trees are cut down and those colonies are lost. Uh, so we are seeing a decline in these bees in areas that are being cleared. However, the tide is changing in terms of the conservation and awareness of these species in the sense that people are rescuing the logs that the colony is, uh, is, is housed within and uh, they're ensuring the survival of those logs by removing them from those land clearing operations and often then installing them in nearby bushland or bringing them into uh, community gardens and schools, places like that where they can be used for educational purposes. My name is Alex Griffiths. I run Little Bee's Secret Garden, which is a native bee demonstration garden and nursery based in Canungra. Little Bee's Secret Garden is a combination of a few things that I love, gardening and native bees. And I combine those two to create an ideas palette of a few things that you could put into your garden to attract native stingless bees. Firstly, plant native bee forage. Bees are particularly attracted to flowers in the spectrum of yellows and blues and whites. If you must use pesticides, do it at night or downwind away from the beehives. Native stingless bees also like to nest in hollow logs. If you have a hollow log in your backyard or in your green space, consider whether you could leave it as a habitat for native stingless bees. If they're looking for a location and they can't find one, they tend to use something that is inappropriate, like a water meter box or a Telstra pit. So have a look around your backyard and see what you can leave for the bees. G'day, my name's Kieran and this is Bo. And today we're gonna to show you how to build a native stingless beehive. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is measure and cut our timber. The thickness of your timber is really important. The bees need to be insulated during summer to avoid the heat and in winter to avoid the cold. So you want to have minimum 25 millimetre thick pine and the rest of the dimensions are in the instructions in the link below. So we need to install some separator bars to be able to hold the nest up when we do a nest separation later on. So we measure the length of metal and we drill some holes in the ends of those. After that we'll measure and cut little notches for our separator bars to sit inside. For the bits of timber that we've cut, we'll apply some glue to the ends and squeeze them together with a clamp, pre-drill some holes and screw them all together. The lid and the bottom of the boxes go on. 
For the bottom of the box, I use glue, but for the lid, I don't use glue because at some stage you might want to open the box up to have a look at your bees inside. Once it's all complete, we drill the entrance hole and we also drill a smaller hole in the back of the top of the box to allow air circulation. Now for finishing your box, what I like to do is use a Japanese wood preserving technique called Shoshugi Barn. Basically you'll need a burner torch and you burn the timber to a point where it starts to crackle and it looks like a crocodile skin. The next step is to use the wire brush to scrape off the excess charcoal. Make sure you follow the grain of the timber. Apply some linseed oil and brush or paint that over the box and then lightly burn the timber again. So now you have a finished bee box and your next step is to find a friend who has some native bees who are ready to split their hive and you can get some bees to move in. These bees play an essential role in the health of our native ecosystems. Most plants rely on pollination, the movement of pollen from one plant to another to ensure that the seeds are genetically diverse in the next generation of plants. In addition to that, they have a beneficial role in our agricultural production. They do the same job on our farmland and our agricultural areas and boost the productivity of our crops. These bees are under threat. Human activities are having negative impacts on these bees, but we can do something about it. We can rescue these bees and preserve them for the future, for the future of humankind as well as our natural ecosystems. Yeah.